All right, my fellow old rollers, uh, welcome to my non Gracie garage uh, slash uh, we'll call it podcast interview studio. Uh, welcome to the show, uh, Blue Jitsu uh, aficionado and member uh, Chris Sizemore, training partner of mine. Really great guy, super kind guy, and uh, got some great ideas about. Uh, uh, police training and I uh, wanted to talk to him about that so Chris welcome to the show thanks for having me it's, uh, it's actually really exciting um, a little bit of backstory um, Chris basically has spent just about the last five years clubbing me like a baby seal <laughs> and <laughs> so <laughs> so I'm gonna do my best in this interview to make him as uncomfortable as humanly possible just just a little bit of payback um, I deserve it. Let's be honest. I deserve it. Yeah, but uh, uh, no. The truth be told, you're actually one of my, my favorite training partners. Um, I pick on you about your athleticism because you're somewhat more athletic than me. Uh, but it's 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 rare in life that you get to you know like only in jujitsu is that an insult. So if I'm being like, right. hey, you're athletic, and he's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> you didn't set the bar very high with being more athletic than you. Though. That, that's you know, you make a fair point. I picked the wrong parents. I really did. Like I, I know there was an athletic me out there somewhere. It just just didn't show up. What are you gonna do? Yeah. So uh, give us just a little bit of history, uh, personal history, and then we'll we'll move transition from there over to the the blue jitsu side of things uh, because I think obviously that's kind of a passion project of yours and it's something I think you guys are doing something that's really important. So we want to get to that, but this is also your interview, so I want to learn about you and uh, introduce you to uh, the Old Roller Nation uh, so that they can uh, learn more about you and learn more from you. Well, first I want to say thank you for having me on. Um, I've listened to a lot of your podcasts. I know you have some awesome guests, so it's a, it's a privilege for me to be on here and get to share and talk with you as well. Uh, my name is Chris Sizemore. I am 33 years old, so I don't know if I'm <laughs> quite making the Old Rollers, but I, I feel old. Like I, I do feel old. I move old. I, I wake up in the morning and everything hurts. And so I feel old. I've made a lot of mistakes training. Because I've been training for a long time. Um, I wrestled since I was a kid. All the way up through high school. I went on and played football in college. So that didn't really help. And then I had a, a, about a six year uh, MMA career. And then uh, I've been training jujitsu since. Strictly jujitsu since um, 2012. And so, a long history of you know impact sports and martial arts and combativeness. So, yeah, and right before the uh, the kind of COVID you know shutdown situation that we have all had, you uh, got your black belt. I, I did, and uh, I actually got to be there for that. So yeah. that was that was really nice. You know, given that I travel, I was bad. So, was so I haven't won it yet. Oh, I, yeah. I have not trained in my black. I got the day I got my black belt. I got hurt that day. Um, I tweaked my knee, and it wasn't anything serious, but something that probably put me out for two weeks or three weeks, sure. and by the time that three weeks was up, all the gyms were shut out. Yeah. So I have not put my black belt on yet, um, other than when Coach Shields put it on me that day. Yeah. So I, I don't know if, if I'm a true black belt yet or not. Well, well I think your athleticism comes. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> athleticism, yeah. I, I guess I've been a black belt for years for just going by athleticism. Fair enough, fair so, enough. Um, yeah, so I, I just got my black belt. I just didn't put a gi on until I was 25 years old. I didn't strictly know gi stuff just because I, you know, had had aspirations for an MMA career at that mm-hmm. time. Um, Coming, that's a question too. Coming from wrestling, did you find? I, I've seen it go one way or the other. As as wrestlers specifically transition to to the gi, they either really get excited about it because of the level of gripping or they get so frustrated they can get caught so many ways that they're just like screw this I'm never putting this thing on and it, it was an internal battle for me um, the only reason why I put on a gear is because I hurt my shoulder really bad I had reconstructive surgery on my left shoulder and I was itching to get back on the mats and I'm like I, I knew the gear was a little bit slower I knew the gear was a little mm-hmm. bit more technical so I was like I'm going to start off with a gear and that's the first time I ever put on a gear um, was after I re- rehabbed my shoulder and came back. And then I probably trained exclusively at a gi for probably six months and then started mixing in. And I, I found I wasn't as good in a gi and no gi um, for mm-hmm. a long time. However, once 
because there's so many different like I was in positions I had no idea what to do. I, I was getting choked in ways that I was like, "How did that happen? How do I how do I stop this?" Like, um, people were passing my guard super easy because I didn't really know how to fight the grips and, mm-hmm. and things of that nature. So it was definitely a, a, a steep learning curve. But once I started picking up on it, I, I equally enjoy the gi training in it mm-hmm. to no gi. I, I probably competition wise, I probably just because of my wrestling background I've been doing the whole life yeah, I'd, probably, I'd probably choose gi or no gi over gi but um, training in it I enjoy both probably equally I don't have a preference over either one and just just you know from having spent a lot of time on the mat with you your the your sort of favored positions are fairly universal in that you can play them pretty readily with or without the gi you, you do a lot of really solid pressure passing uh, and then uh, some close guard and half guard, and um, we'll say some athletic passing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, like leg drag stuff, sure. and, and you know things that are not not necessarily gi dependent. And so I, I could see once once your brain sort of comes yeah. to that 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 uh, familiarity with what things can happen that are bad, then the the, the uptake wouldn't be wouldn't be that big. And I don't know if this is just me or if it's shared but I feel like my passes are easier in a gi because you have those grips and I can get sure I can build my way to a pass easier slower I, I don't have to like explode through a move I can kind of pull myself through it mm-hmm. um, I feel like my submissions are better no gi mm-hmm. um, I don't know why that is I, I, I do a lot of chokes so I feel like the lapel kind of gets in the way for some of my chokes um, That's fair. I'm not a great lapel choker so it's not really a huge part of my game so I feel like my passing and maybe my point points are a little bit better in the gi, but um, my submission game and finishing ability is better in the gi. Yeah, that, that that makes sense, and I think also with with that not only wrestling but but MMA background, like when you said points, a lot of the the uh, the IBJJF meta or point meta lends itself toward uh, you know an MMA based game where you know, you're you're trying to get to the top you're trying to you know maintain top position and then you know all, all that you have to do is then add in strikes that's a pretty pretty good formula for ground and pound you sure. know, if you're mount or knee on belly even cross side and not only for MMA but for what I do as a profession as mm-hmm. a police officer yeah and so and it just kind of worked out that way that my style not that you're punching people a lot but you no, know it, maintaining it, top position. no sure but yeah. that <laughs> that uh, we don't want to play guard we don't we're we don't want to do things on our back we want to be the person on top and control them on top and kind of float on top and, and work from there so yeah a lot of real world aspects I'd say probably self defense too you're probably not going to want to be on your back as much on concrete as you would um, being on top, so yeah, that kind of goes back to uh, one of the first guests that I had on the show, uh, Joel Bain. Uh, he said that he wants to teach people to be confident off their back, not on their back. Meaning, if you get put there, you're going to have some responses, but it's not that you're going to choose that or that that's that's the place to be. Sure, and that's that's we're, we're going to be good enough to get away from it. But if we get put there, we're going to still have something for you. Yeah. And sports-wise, I, I think it's kind of going the other way. But if you look at it from, like, a self-defense-wise, or, like, like I said, for, for our profession, for law enforcement, I would, yeah, top position is, is king. Yeah. So was jujitsu? jitsu knowing a little bit about your background, um, you had, you were kind of, we've had a lot of, like, the OGs of uh, American, uh, you know, uh, uh, jiu-jitsu history on the show talking about when you're having to travel like 400 miles Friday night to go get training over the weekend and then you know drive back I mean we uh, Mark Kukro was saying that he was traveling I believe from Maryland to New York on the weekends Friday night train Saturday morning Saturday evening Sunday morning Sunday evening and then drive back to be at work on Monday and just knowing a little bit about it I know you had some experiences somewhat like that where you're trying to find uh, training camps for your your uh, your MMA career, mm-hmm. and uh, so I wanted you to talk a little bit about that because look, this is a tough spot we're all in. This this COVID scenario. I'm hoping that when you see this, that this is all over. I hope next week this ends. But 
things are different now because jujitsu is so proliferated that uh, you know the the gym that that we're a part of. There's five more, and, and you know where we're at. It's not a huge city. You know what I mean? It's it's already small, so um, it's everywhere, and yet it was taken away from us. And while this sucks, I'm trying to remind myself and convince myself that this is a this is not a new situation. Like having difficult time getting to training, that's an old thing. Like that's oh, that's yeah. how it was. So like talk a little bit about that. So uh, you're definitely right. The availability of quality training is night and day from when I started. So, um, there, and I I started training probably about a half hour south of Chicago. So there's still quality training in the Chicago area. Yeah. There's always quality training, but I didn't know any better. I, I was a college kid. I was playing college football at the time, and um, I wasn't getting a lot of playing time. So I, I you weren't athletic enough. Yeah, exactly. You want to talk about some athletes? Like, I was not athletic enough. Um, <laughs> It didn't help. I was a linebacker at 205 pounds, but I uh, I would go to just a local gym in my hometown, which was nothing. It was a bunch of guys that were watching UFC videos on tape, and some of them had a martial arts background. There's one guy had a boxing background. I came from the wrestling background, and we just kind of like trained together and grew up together. And once I started fighting, like I recognized like this is great, this is good, but I need to travel and go other places. So I. I did a, a training camp at Sit Yacht Tong, Boston. I lived in Boston for three months. Um, I lived in the dorms at the Hit Squad, uh, Hughes Intensive Training down in Grant City, Illinois. Yeah. Um, I actually traveled to Puerto Rico and, and stayed out there for a couple months and did some boxing training out there. And what I do is I just go, I go and I'd stay for a little while. I write things down in my journal, which mm-hmm. who knows where that journal is now. But and I bring it back and I get it together with all my training partners and we all just train it. Yeah. And not the most effective way of training. Um, it's because it's like I'm, I'm, I'm taking what a really great instructor just showed me, and I'm trying to reciprocate that and bring it back. But I'm probably bringing a fraction of what sure. the detail that he sure. showed. I'm um, just trying to keep up and what I can retain. And then as I pass it on to them, they're getting a fraction of what I'm showing them. So it wasn't the most effective. But as far as at the time and compared to. You know, staying in the same place, being stagnant, training with the same people all the time. Um, it was definitely a development for me as a, as a fighter and as a yeah. grappler. As yeah. Well. I think what what fascinates me about that, too, is, is one of the central themes of this podcast has been, as I've you know talked to and interviewed more and more people, is that you have to be in the driver's seat of your training. Even starting at white belt, so you're a 45 year old guy or gal, and you decide, hey, today's the day I'm going to jujitsu class. You have to be an active participant, even with great coaching, because great coaching does help. But if the student is not engaged, it doesn't matter. So you had you were in a scenario where you didn't have access to great coaching, so you had to go out and get it. And then bring it back, and everybody just had to work and train it up, and, and you know try and remember like, oh, was this what I you know what they mm-hmm. said? You know, and and so you put yourself in the driver's seat of your training, and while you didn't have an ideal scenario, you did you 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 made it the best it could be, right? Yeah. And over and over and over, you've heard similar stories where you know people uh, like Jake Shan, he was talking about uh, he wanted to learn catch wrestling from. Carl Gotch, and this was in like the late 80s, early 90s, you know, you didn't have the internet where you could just look on somebody's website and email info at carlgotch.com, you know, it didn't work that way, and so he found a phone number uh, that allegedly was Carl Gotch's and just called, and it turned out that it was, or maybe, maybe he wrote a letter uh, and left his phone number on the letter and just hoped that he got the right address because he didn't know yeah. And, you know, those stories fascinate me because, you know, if you want it, it's there. And, you know, we're, like I said, we're in a tough situation here. But I think the way that we can maybe encourage or, or just, just, you know, keep ourselves in the fight, so to speak, is to realize that being in a tough situation is actually not new. Like, the new thing was that we were in a tough situation. You know, like everything was so easy. So we, um, 
I'm trying to keep myself and you know hopefully some of my uh, old roller brothers and sisters out there you know like without because I'll be honest like got a little depressing from you know, like, <laughs> when it was all taken away so uh, I'm just trying to, to keep myself in perspective because it has been so easy for me in comparison to what yeah. you guys had and you you're exactly right we're going back to how it was what were we doing we were training in garages and warehouses what are guys doing now right like the gyms are closed so they throw down masks in their garage and get three or four other buddies together and start drilling techniques and doing that kind of we didn't have access to YouTube but we would buy the uh, the, the Eddie Bravo half guard series and my buddies were all the rubber guard at the time and we had the BJ Penn book and all the stuff and yeah. it, it was the the book version of the ancient version of YouTube where yeah. we, we flip a book and go through the techniques and it's very similar to how it is now I'm sure guys are getting together in garages and pulling up YouTube and saying hey let's try this let's go through this technique and, and work it through things so and not ideal but not the worst no. you know you can get good training you can become a black belt you know with that foundation because I think you're living proof of that yeah. uh, so you know to kind of move on like we talked a little bit about going from wrestling and football uh, getting some MMA camps and stuff I've seen some of your, your MMA fights on YouTube uh, which were uh, pretty fun like uh, you, you put on a good show I, I think you were a fun fighter yeah. but transitioning from MMA you know then to just doing jiu-jitsu what was that what what brought that transition on and then what was that like so my last fight was in 2012 against uh Nick Alvin, who everyone knows is Chewy from Chew Jitsu. Um, and that later that year, I had got hired on the police department where I currently work. And so I had to make a decision at that time. I didn't even know if they would approve me to go and continue an MMA career, but I had to make a decision like, do I want to train MMA and show up to work with black eyes? And, you know, <laughs> Scrapes all over my face all the time. E even though it still happens, but it definitely happened a lot more when oh, I was yeah, training sure. MMA. Sure. Um, so I had to make that choice, and I also had to make the the, the realization with myself that if I, when I was training MMA, I was putting 110 percent into my training. Mm -hmm. Whereas now I have a full time job, and I'm starting to start a family, and all this kind of stuff, and I'm starting to focus on you know developing my grappling side of it. I wasn't going to have, and I still don't have the time to devote to an MMA career or prep for an MMA fight. Yeah, I think I, I can see what you're saying. Like if you're if you're going to go into a pro fight, you don't want to go into it thinking, you know, if only I had four more hours a week, because I certainly had room within my recovery that I could have done that training. Uh, and I don't it's think also, you want that in the back of your mind. Yeah, it's mental. That's what I'm gonna say. It's it's probably more mental. Like, man, I uh, I didn't. I put eighty five percent of this instead of a hundred percent. I could have trained harder, or I wish I had more time to train. Like I'm wearing myself out training um, outside of work, and then going to work, and then having to you know take care of the family life. So it, it's probably more mental thing. But uh, I mean, I'm not upset about it or anything. I do miss those things, but um, I'm always a person that looks ahead and try to set goals for what I'm doing now, rather than looking back and seeing kind of what my my history was. Well, you know, having a family is a choice. Yeah. Uh, it's a very rewarding one, but nobody ever said it was easy. Uh, I can say from my own experience that I'll just vicariously look through my sons and <laughs> put them through boot camps <laughs> at age 12. And Teaching them uh, uh, calf kicks and uh -huh. uh, double legs, you know, uh -huh. before daycare. Yeah. Who, who knows what, when they're old enough, like what kind of styles will be coming through MMA, you know, like, because it just evolved. The game just evolves, and the athletes going through it just evolves so much. So. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's definitely a fascinating laboratory. Yeah. And from having watched a lot of uh, uh, Farasa Hobby uh, breakdowns, like of, of MMA fights, he's talked a lot about certain times, like early in in MMA, jujitsu pretty much ruled, and then wrestlers uh, kind of came in with, a, you know, like a, a takedown and ground a pound. Uh, you know, kind of way of thinking, and that that ruled for a long time. And then strikers eventually came to a place where they were harder to take down, which made what they did the more sprawl and brawl. Yeah, sprawl and brawl. And and so you've had this this continual evolution. But he was talking about how the clock and the stand up uh, from a grappling exchange, where 
the ref may say like there's not a lot of action so we're standing them up those those actions either the clock stopping someone when they were in a dominant position and then we start standing again or the ref standing them up completely changed the evolution of uh, you know like how jujitsu and, and wrestling and striking would interplay because the a big part of jiu-jitsu especially guard play and bottom play is time and if you don't have time to you know, get someone a little bit gassed it's harder oh. especially someone with a, an explosive athleticism to keep them in an effective range within uh, you know some sort of a guard you know, configuration oh sure high level athletes that are very well trained and you put them you put them in a jiu-jitsu five minute round and it's not enough so like nowadays, you don't see very many submissions that aren't set up by a, a knockdown or mm -hmm. where they're rocked already and then have some vulnerability because they're, you know, loopy. So it's just, I agree with that evolution. You, you see it a lot and everyone's so well trained that it's kind of even evening the playing field right now. Yeah, it, it's it's a very, if, if you were being really, you know, kind of like nitpicky or hair splitty, you could say the clock and the ref in those two cases have changed how MMA relates purely to self-defense and that's that's kind of where I'm going you know with what you guys do yeah. is that uh, Blue Jitsu um, is it is a self-defense minded uh, you know Jiu Jitsu methodology for police officers sure. and so it, it, initially MMA was the lab that proved that that this stuff works like it you know it really did prove that this is a useful and uh, effective martial art but those two factors have changed you know some of that usefulness in the sport of MMA and look I love grappling but even I can get a little bit bored if you know somebody is just like hunkered down and mm -hmm. you know just holding someone and you know staying within their guard in that kind of like dead bug posture where like nothing's happening and they're just waiting for the bell to ring it's like Stand them up. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. I want to see someone bang. <laughs> yeah. So I understand the entertainment value. Like, you, if you don't get eyeballs to the screen, the sport dies. And right. So I, I get it. I, I don't want to sound like I'm, you know, bashing on MMA because I'm not. I'm a fan and, you know, I, I understand that element. But talk a little bit about, you know, some of the things from your background that have evolved into your philosophy for Blue Jitsu. Uh, and, you know, what, because I will be honest and say that I think having an MMA background, probably a pretty good thing for someone who wants to develop a self-defense curriculum because, you know, you got you got to been in the fire if, sure. you're, you know, if you want to say that you're going to teach from that. So when I got hired in the police department, I was, I was the only person actively training. And I was, some officers, like, they get hired and they start training. I was a jiu-jitsu, I was an MMA guy, not necessarily a jiu-jitsu guy. Yeah. Versed in jiu-jitsu, but I was an MMA guy that became a cop rather than a cop that became a jiu-jitsu guy. So um, I was the only one in the department training. We had a, a rep, several hundred, 600, 650, something like that department, size department. So I was the only one out of 650 training. And I go through um, the training academy, and they're showing all these moves and all these, and it's like, uh, Aikido type stuff, Aikido, like, joint locks and pressure points and you know all these different things takedowns from just holding one person's arm and I'm like I've never seen this like if this was effective how come I've never seen this in an MMA fight like mm -hmm. how come I've never seen this in training how if this is an effective move how come high level athletes aren't able to get it you know and um, I think that's a really good filter because high level athletes can do stuff that the rest of us even can't. So like, if and they're doing it to other high level athletes. Yeah, it's, yeah. So it's like, if it's not working for that guy, right? Then how's it going to work for us normaltons? Sure. So um, since then, you know, uh, Paul Hogan, who myself, Paul Hogan, and Sam Ferguson founded Blue Jitsu, and we all worked together. Paul Hogan got hired on. I like two out of the three of them. <laughs> Am, am I one of the two? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Sam, Sam and I, to give just a little bit of a quick background, uh, Sam was also a, a training partner of mine. And the first day I rolled with Sam, he was training for Worlds, but <laughs> I didn't know it. And he didn't tell me. Did he know it? <laughs> he knew it. Because he's always training for Worlds. 
<laughs> well, every I mean, role is a train for a world. Well, yeah, but he, I mean, he, I think he got silver that year. Uh, he did really well. Oh, yeah. Except, I didn't know that I was in the camp. You know, I was just like, I just showed up, slap bump, and thinking we're just going to have a friendly role. I think like, you were, are we fighting? <laughs> I think you were crucial to his silver medal at Worlds. I, I could have been. And maybe just, you know, beating my ass is, is why that happened. Yeah. Um, anyway, sorry, I, I didn't want to interject. I just wanted to pick on Sam a little bit. Yeah, Sam, Sam's easy to pick on, but he takes it well. Um, so, Paul got hired shortly after Sam got hired. And Sam and I were both from Illinois. We kind of came from the same circle. We know the same people. We just never crossed paths. Like, I didn't know him before he got hired. Yes, for sure. But we all we knew all the same. When we were like, hey, you know this guy? Yeah, I trained with that guy. I trained with that So we know all the same people. Both and, in the corn. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Moore. Sam's a Southern Illinois. Or, I'm sorry. Central Illinois, Sam. Sorry. Mm. Champagne's in Central Illinois. But, um... Yeah, we like we had fought through the same circuit. He was just kind of—he's younger than me, so he was—he was a few years behind me as I went. I was doing something else when he was coming through. Sure. So, um, they got hired, and Sam was at the time a brown belt, like you said, very accomplished brown belt. Yeah. Went on to win world as a police officer. Went on to win world, um, and then Paul was a purple belt who had been training for several years as well under Brian Jones, and so we kind of got together and we we're like. This isn't working. Like what? What the police officers are learning right now is not working. How do we get them to train? How do we get them exposed to the sport of jitsu? Because it's so beneficial for what we do in more ways than one. And so we kind of got together and we came up with the idea of blue jitsu. And I, every time I go on a podcast and talk about blue jitsu, I take credit for the name because it's it my my creation. I'm just trying to make up rhymes and came up with blue jitsu um but after we came up with the name we, we came up with goals and the biggest goals was to um, expose officers to jiu-jitsu so we, we've developed a curriculum to teach specifically to officers and we are working currently working to get that curriculum certified and implemented in academies but our main goal our first goal was to just get officers training let's show officers what the benefits are and let's give them a little taste and let them know how fun it can be and so what we were doing was um, before COVID we would put on quarterly seminars and they were completely free show up we give you we give you a little tidbit of our curriculum we go over techniques we'd have some roles at the end have a lot of people that never trained before people from different cities and states come in and kind of train with us as well and just kind of have that camaraderie where it's a police only environment to where um, I guess they feel safe training. You know, I, I would think even taking taking the the technique, whatever sparring you may or may not do, situational sparring, whatever, taking all that away, just having a bunch of like minded people, you know, who you know, in a way, are are looking to learn, would be would be just a great supportive environment. And I don't mean like supportive, like kumbaya supportive, but you know, you're gonna have people saying like, you know, <laughs> I was trying to arrest this person and this happened and it sucked and you know, I worked through it, but maybe there was a better way that we could, you know, we could put this together. And so you're gonna have just a lot of experience bouncing off, you know, and, and from knowing you guys, like knowing Paul, like uh, Paul had a couple of experiences where, you know, people really did try to, you know, Try to take him on. Paul gets tested all the time. Yeah, and Paul. And Paul's also five one hundred twenty seven pounds, man. <laughs> Maybe he's a little bit bigger than that. But I will say he does have a pretty uh, impressive cauliflower. He's, he's probably like between the three of us. He's probably pound for pound best of us. We're just so much bigger than him that we have. Yeah, more athletic. You know, yeah, oh yeah, strength. But you could think of that like once again one of the the big central themes that have arisen from this podcast is that the mat is a lab and when you have all those people at those at those seminars together talking about issues that you've had in an environment where you're you're listening to one another and trying to actually find solutions as to be like as opposed to just be like well this is what we do you're saying you know these are solutions how can we how can we find something that applied to this spot sure 
uh, I would think that even that is is just a great thing. Like take the curriculum away, mm -hmm. take all the, the 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 technique away. Just having a place where you can say, "Man, I, I had a tough one here. What can we do to you know to be better?" Would just that would be a, a tremendous benefit. Well, not only that, but the exposure to this to the martial art because. I try to put myself in the shoe of the officer that's never trained before, and they're going to the gym for the first time. And I remember going to gyms for the first time. Maybe not, you know, the first time I ever trained, but I remember going to hit squad, sitting in the car or in the parking lot, and thinking, "This is this is going to be awesome. I'm so excited. I'm so nervous. What's going to happen to me?" Like having all these emotions go through me in yeah. the parking lot, having that anxiety of you know walking into a place that I'm not familiar with. And so for them to be able to walk into a place where maybe they're not familiar with what we're going to be doing, but they see familiar faces, they know everyone kind of works under the same umbrella, mm -hmm. the same profession, you know, the same shared life experiences, and, um, and especially if they know us and they know like we're not going to go in there with any egos, we're going to have a, a fun learning environment, yeah. I think that helps them say, okay, you know, I've been wanting to give this a shot. This is my opportunity to go in and kind of learn a little bit about this and see if I like it. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Uh, I, I like the two-pronged approach because one side is how can we further improve the technique base? Mm -hmm. And that's a part. But the other side is how can we further incentivize police officers to take advantage of these techniques and, and of this practice method? Because... Jiu-Jitsu is not just a set of techniques, it's also a method of practicing with the, the live training, the sparring, the mm -hmm. situational sparring, the technique drilling. All those things are, uh, I'm guessing, as a non-police officer, really beneficial for your situational awareness. If you find yourself in a scuff, you know, like in a scuffle, I don't know where I got the word scuff, like, <laughs> just making up words here. But if you find yourself in a, in a situation, but, you know, you've spent three or four days a week for an hour rolling, you know, like the fight or flight response has to be reduced and you have to be, you know, more capable of, of dealing with this situation globally as opposed to just, you know, like a real fight or flight scenario where you're tunnel vision and, and in, in a real funk. Think about it like this. Each row bands. If y'all don't know Ichiro, Ichiro was a, a high-level middle linebacker for a D1 school, had NFL looks, um, wrestled in high school, probably the best athlete that I know personally. Uh, one of, one of the best athletes I know personally. Just barely better than me. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you said no. um, but freak strength, uh, he's an open book, he'll listen to you, he'll learn. Um, having each row bands on top of you four days a week and you go on street and some guy tries to fight you that's not each row bands like you've already been through the wars with each row bands on the street like or in the map this guy that's going to fight you on the street may, may be bigger maybe stronger than you but everything's going to be you're going to have that comfort level because you've had someone bigger and stronger and better than this guy trying to simulate hurting you Right, you, and there's a second side of that, which which I've kind of seen in in uh, folks like Ichiro with a lot of athletic gifts could potentially be in a scenario where they're physically more capable than they actually understand how capable they can be. Mm -hmm. So they get in a dust up and you know like go ten on somebody, and it's like they really hurt them. So having that repetitive practice of like, you know, down regulating how much effort, you know, they're, they're putting sure. into it, uh, potentially makes them safe because this is obviously a very litigious and fractious political environment. Mm -hmm. And so we don't want, you know, police officers, uh, you know, further escalating situations, we want de-escalating and having control as opposed to like getting out of control. One thing I talk to the recruits about it is um, the more you train and the more comfortable you get, when you get into a real life situation, you enter the matrix, right? You, everything slows down around you. Because a lot of the guys that have no fighting experience or haven't been in a lot of scuffles growing, scuffs growing up, <laughs> um, you know, they get used to forces. And I talk to them afterwards because I'm a supervisor and I talk to them and they're like, 
they're telling me things that are happening, and then I go back and look at the body camera, and it's different. And it's not different because they're lying to me or, or they're wrong in any way. It's different because their mind is perceptual. Yeah, they, it went like this. Mm-hmm. And so they're piecing together, you know, all these different things that happen. Everything happens so fast, and everything moves so fast. And um, it, you know, with the adrenaline rush and your heart rate going up and all that stuff, it makes you prone for mistakes. Mm-hmm. Whereas when you are in this training environment to where you can you can practice these things and be very comfortable being uncomfortable, which is one of the big concepts and philosophy behind Jiu Jitsu. Being mm-hmm. very comfortable being uncomfortable. Once you get into an altercation, instead of everything speeding up and going fast and your potential for mistakes speeding up or increasing, everything slows down. And so you you see that this arm's available, I'm gonna trap this arm. Oh, this guy's reaching for this. I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure that I protect over here. Oh, his buddy is circling around me this way. Mm-hmm. And, and you can see all this stuff. You're not Entering like, like this little this little ball to where it's just you and the other guy and whoever rolls out on top is going to win. And yeah, it's more of a, a technical. It's more of a, everything slowed down and your situation situational awareness increases and and helps you go through it. And so that when you're done, you can be like that wasn't that bad. Yeah. Well, and and something that what you were saying really stuck out is. This person's reaching for this, or you know, his buddy's trying to circle behind me, or things like that. In in a real adrenalized, you know, fight or flight um, uh, scenario, our perceptual field narrows to where we're we're looking through almost like coffee straws. Mm-hmm. And you get this tunnel vision where you're only focused on the specific threat that your brain has decided is the most important one, uh, and being able to widen that perceptual field. I can only imagine, once again, not working in that environment is a very great benefit to someone uh, because you don't, you know, on the mat we have a certain amount of control over, you know, what the situation is because we know and trust that the other person isn't trying to hurt us. But in, in that scenario, you don't control the environment. So to be able to perceive what's happening more globally, maybe not 100%, but at least a lot sure. closer than that you know, coffee straw thing would be a great benefit. And you, you talk about the coffee straw, think about uh, someone who doesn't have continuous training, someone who went through the 40-hour course in the academy, and you know, only when they're mandated do they do any other training. Yeah. They get in that altercation, they look through the coffee straws, because like you said, everything constricts, and then the, the things that they're trying to do to this person aren't working. So now, how, how much more constricted those coffee straws? Because they're, what they're trying to do to control this person is ineffective. So now, their heart rate, they're getting more anxiety. Oh, I gotta do something else, I gotta do something else. Yeah. And they don't have the training to know, like, I have option this, option this, option this. They probably have, you know, memories of the academy or know that they have their belt and what kind of weapons they have in their belt, but um, everything kind of constricts just a little bit more because they have that anxiety of not being able to effectively control somebody, which makes them more prone for mistakes. Less, yeah, even more exaggerates the adrenal response. Yes. Adrenal response. Um, that reminds me a lot. Of, I read a book a long time ago. Um, I can't remember who wrote it. He was, he was either he was former military, but he may have also been a police officer. It's called the On Combat, and it talks about the in in a, a life or death scenario. We only have three ways that we can respond. And, the first is reflexive, the second is instinctual, and the last is trained. And the trained response is obviously the one that is the most valuable, but it only comes to light if you've repetitively trained and drilled in a, you know, like a, a, a muscle muscle memory uh, to have to have access to it. Sure. So otherwise, you just have those reflexive and coffee straw ones. And uh, uh, I think uh, one of the things he said was, it's kind of been a cliche, but uh, in, in, in a life or death scenario, we cannot rise to the occasion. We can only fall back on our training. And if you haven't repetitively trained, you don't have much to fall back on, which I don't want police officers to ever be in a life or death scenario. But if you are, I want you guys to be, you know, trained to handle it, you know, and repetitively, like continuously practicing so that your brains are at their highest capacity to, to deal with that threat. And the more you train, the the less likely you'll end up in a life or death scenario. Because, like I said, you get in a situation to where your stuff, your your techniques aren't effective because you haven't trained them, and so they're not working. So you're allowing more opportunity for them. 
you're not able to control them, um, the sooner you can get them under control and the better you are controlling them, the less likely they are to hurt you. And so you, yeah. you kind of lessen that chance of it turning into this, you know, life or death. I, had, I hadn't even considered the time in that, in that equation, but obviously in any, uh, you know, scuff, <laughs> the less time that it happens, the better for everyone involved. Yes. You know? yeah. But I, once again, I hadn't really considered that because I guess I thought that that was an uncontrollable variable. But if you are well trained, if you are competent, if you are able to adequately deal with a threat, then you can neutralize it quickly, and you know, in a way that's best for yourself and the community, you know, and, and your department. If, if again, for instance, for example, if a guy has a knife in his in his waistband and I don't realize it, and he starts fighting me, and we end up in a fight, and I put in the handcuffs within thirty seconds, I can find that knife later on. If I end up fighting him for another two, three, four, five minutes and he gets in a position of control, and he's able to draw that knife, um, that puts me more vulnerable. So the faster I can get him under control, the better it is, the safer it is going to be for me, which is obvious, but that's where the jiu-jitsu comes in. That's where the training is. You're going to be able to control someone quicker, more effectively, than if you are untrained. So let's let's talk a little bit about, I know you guys are developing uh, uh, a curriculum of, of you know, like the, the most most useful techniques for police officers. And it is based out of jiu-jitsu and wrestling. Uh, and it's it's basically like a, a means of, of control, you know, so that you can, you know, get a person uh, who's, you know, acting a little bit bad uh, to be less capable of acting bad and, and more under your control. Yes. But I'm also hearing that there's, there's a training element to it, too. It's not just a series of techniques. It's also a training methodology. Sure. Uh-huh. So talk about that. Well, I, I train in four different, I train officers in four different circumstances. So, I train new recruits who know absolutely nothing and who are mandated to go through it. And then every year, officers have to go through what's called in-service, which is kind of like a refresher training or an updated training or whatever. And so every year, every sworn, I, I call them sworn, that's, that's officers after their recruits that get sworn in, so I call them sworn officers. So I train sworn officers. Every officer will see me in training four hours a year, or see go through the training course that I teach four hours a year. So everyone's mandated to do that. So I teach recruits that are that are learning the technique for the first time. The sworn officers are learning techniques for the first time because we're transitioning to jiu-jitsu. And then we teach a 40-hour course for sworn officers volunteer for. It. And so um, that's a little bit different as well. And then the blue jitsu, which is not through um, the department we teach on our own, and that's people that show up on their own time. They're not getting paid for it. They just have an interest in jujitsu and, and come out and try to learn. So I, I teach on four different levels, and you kind of have to skew them and scale them back for each one. Yeah. Um, the recruits, they're, and everyone goes too hard, which every white belt goes too hard, right? They're, they're effectively spazzy white belt. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. So one of the concepts I've been coming up is the one percent rule, and uh, I'm trying to you know work it out and have some tweaks and trying to get some feedback on it from you know Paul and Sam when I when I speak with them about it. But one of the one things about the one percent rule is when they are drilling and just learning the techniques. If I see them going, I say one percent, and so it's not zero percent because a lot of guys don't know how to be a good bad guy. So the bad guy will. Well, you know, lay as a dead fish and not give any base and fall over as soon as as soon as someone moves over. So uh, you explain this to them. If I say one percent, that means base. Keep your base, but you are not giving any other resistance outside of that. And that way, that they can work through the techniques. Because what what happens is that first day, everyone's so amped up and they're they're so ready to to learn all these techniques and they're so ready to show everyone how tough they are and all this mm-hmm. stuff. I think about forty hours of jujitsu in a week. Five days, 40 hours, eight it's hour days. Tough on your body. Right. And they get worn out within the first instruction block because yeah. they are going so hard. And so the, the concept behind the 1% rule is I can say, if I see guys going hard, hey, 1%, 1%, 1%. And that way they know they can scale it. I don't have to say, hey, you guys are going too hard because that, that's what's before. And they'd, like, they'd stop for a minute and then they'd start going hard again. Like they don't know what, they don't kind of understand what going too hard is but if I can really break down and define what 1% means 
and it's easy to learn and, it, and it's easy to kind of visualize. It's, it's not literally 1%, you're giving a little bit more than 1%, but it's something easy that I can say and easy for them to pick up on. That um, makes sense. So they're not wearing themselves out hour one, day one of 40. Yeah. yeah. So you're, you're scaling resistance, but having to find a way uh, to convince someone who doesn't have, uh, hasn't learned how to control that level of resistance, and you're having to teach them how to how to control it very quickly. Yes. Which I can see that being a challenge if you got if you got a mat full of forty spazzy white belts and you're trying to teach yes, effective technique. It's what it is. You just described the training environment. Yeah, and, and that's not to disrespect them. We've all been through okay. that. You know, everyone goes through that period. You have to because you're learning. You're learning the physical control to be able to act and react, uh, you know, at the appropriate level of yeah. force uh, to be to be efficient and to be effective. But out of the gate, you don't know that, so it's just a hundred percent. That's you know that that's sure. the most I can give should work. And for the recruits, it's it's not as worrisome from like an injury standpoint um, because most of them are in really good shape. They're they're in the middle of academy training, so you know they're probably. Some, a lot of them are probably in the best shape they've ever been in, but for the sworn class, um, they're older guys. Some of them are young. Some of them are in their forties. Some of them, are, you know, are, have different varying levels of injuries and history and you know body wear and tear. And so, like for them, it's very important because if a crew gets hurt, it's fine. We can wait till they recover and. and catch them up on their classes, but if an officer gets hurt, he's he's not around his beat. Mm-hmm. We, gotta, we gotta replace him with somebody. Yeah. We gotta, so it's very important that we sh- stress that early on that, look, you all can't, you all can't intentionally or unintentionally be hurting each other because you all have to have a job you got to do. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's such a fine line. Um, the problem with recruits is they go so fast they all learn the techniques. And so um, the one percent rule for them is more. Let's slow down so you can learn how to do it slow before you can do it fast. If, if you can't do it slow, then that means you're not doing it right fast. You, you're relying on your athleticism, strength. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, what you bring up there is it, it reminds me of uh, one of the very first interviews we did with Keith was with Keith Owen. Uh, he's a Pedro Sauer black belt in Idaho, and was uh, for. I think at least 10 or 12 years in charge of all police combatives training uh, for the state of Idaho, like the, the different sheriff's departments mm-hmm. within the counties. Uh, and, and one of the things that he said that was a, is the biggest challenge that he feels that we face is finding a way for police officers not just to train jujitsu, like to get them in the door, but then also to create safe training uh, uh, so that we keep them on the beat, you know. So there's there's two elements. There's we gotta you know make them interested and willing to you know come in and, and get tapped, but also have that be safe enough that you know they continue to be able to, to be ready for the job at all times, or at least at most times. And it's hard. Um, ego gets thrown around a lot, and I, I hate to say I hate to say it's ego. Like cops aren't these like egotistical guys that you know, I work with a lot of great people on my department that have no egos whatsoever but don't train jiu-jitsu and I don't think ego is a part of it I think it's more the comfortability like they don't want to be in that uncomfortable position and so um, they either won't train because of that or they go extra hard because they don't want to be put in a position that makes them uncomfortable sure and they don't know any better yeah, and, and Keith was even saying he, he kind of touched on a similar situation you know, and, and line of thought. He's like, if, I, if I'm training someone and I know this guy is going to be pulling somebody over, you know, 40 miles away from his nearest backup, I need him to, to know or her that, you know, when they come up to the door, they can handle themselves. And so... We say ego is like it's a bad thing, but in in that scenario, it's not necessarily a bad thing. We need you, as a police officer, to have the confidence in yourself that you know, in a in a scuff, <laughs> you're gonna be all right. You know, if if it doesn't sure. go good, you know, in in your right out of the gate. So you got to be able to deal with it, and that's a middle thing. You know, it, there's a couple of ways that you could do it. 
we could say we could train it in jiu-jitsu and you know you've been through enough tough spots that you can handle them but if you didn't have that it's also pretty good to have an innate sense of I'm going to be able to take care of this sure and it's so funny that the varying levels that you have to like gauge that so because there's false confidence as well mm -hmm. um, it's super different teaching so I've described teaching the recruits for 40 hours I've described teaching the sworn for 40 hours teaching the sworn that don't volunteer to come that are mandated for the four hours every year to come through that's the biggest difficulty because one they don't want to be there two they want to say and come up with every reason why either that won't work or why that won't work for me. Um, yeah, yeah, it's not going to work if you don't train it. Yeah, it's not going to work if you don't pay attention and you know get your reps. In. Yeah, of course it's not going to work. Um, but they'll come. I had one we were teaching like closing the distance and going for a, a bear hug takedown. Um, and I had one sergeant who's literally been on forever. Um, say, you know, I'd be interested in seeing, you know, if, if you could close that distance before I could pull my gun out and shoot you because I'm a quick draw. I was like, well, if you could perceive prior to me moving that this is going to be a deadly force situation, maybe you'd pull it out and pull it. But by the time you perceive it's a deadly force situation and you can pull your gun, I've already put you on your back. Which is why it's important to know this position. But it's always that like skeptical. I had a girl ask like, "Did you all practice this in your uniform?" It was like my favorite technique ever. From uh, <laughs> I love, I love. Uh, it was a double leg. <laughs> no, from, from bottom up. Uh, we were teaching. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think Coach Shields calls it a uh, leg drag from bottom up. Oh, from, okay. I yeah. call it ankle trap. We, yeah. we trap the ankle and, and trip your way out. So we were teaching that, and she just looked. She's like, "Have you guys tried that?" And I was like. I can do this on anybody in this class right now in my sleep. And like, you're gonna sit here and ask me if I've tried this with my uniform. Yeah, of course. We we pressure tested everything. Like, and just that skepticism about it. And you, you can tell like some people really like it, and some people are like, ah, I don't think this would work. Blah blah blah. And uh, you know, getting through that that course, it's fun to teach because just because they're paying me to teach jujitsu, but it's you can't get everyone on board. And which is unfortunate because it's so much better than what they're... If you would look at it from that scope, like, give me an alternative. What have you learned prior to this that is better than what we're showing you right now? And if you say nothing, then you need to shut up and, and pay attention and drill. These moves. Well, you know, as I'm listening to you, though, even though, yes, that would have to be frustrating, especially because you've spent, you know, so many hours, you know, over the years creating a technique base within yourself... You know, that you're trying to hand off. You know, you don't become a black belt half ass. It's it's a it's a thing that you have to you can't phone that in. Yeah. And so I, I could see the frustration, but I also think that potentially uh, that lab of group of skeptics could be a great lab of you know the I don't want to say sales, but the buy in side of blue jitsu, which is if I can, it's going to be very difficult to, to break through this particular fence. But if I can, then I've really got something in terms of getting people in the door. Because if that group that doesn't want to go through the door, if you can even get 5 to 10% of them, then anybody with a lower level of skepticism and or disinterest, uh, you, could, you could really maximize and take advantage of that group, which sure. is a bigger group, I think. And I think a lot of... A lot of my goals when I first started teaching and I first started training was to show how effective it was. And I don't do it as much anymore because I, I feel like it was more, I, it was getting on the border of like feeding my own ego, like testing myself when this training wasn't for me, it was actually for them. But with the recruits, I would I'd make sure I'd go with the biggest guys. I'd make sure I'd go with the biggest guys and I'd wear them, I'd wear them the hell out. I would, I remember several times having, you know, football players, D1 football players coming through the academy and making sure, okay, I need to go with that guy because I weigh 195 pounds. This guy weighs 240 solid muscle. He's going to know that that 240 solid muscle is not as effective as he thinks it is. And it, like I said, it was kind of a, a, an ego feeding thing for me, but at the same time, it lets them know, like, yeah, your muscles and your strength and your athleticism, it, 
it's going to come in handy for you, but it's not the end all be all. You're not invincible. And so, um, getting the buy in that way. I think one of the things that sold, sold the department and even letting me, you know, have a bigger role in the defensive tactics program was um, the commander watched me take one of one of their star athletes that was coming through was probably the best PT guy, 240, solid muscle, played running back for a D1 college, all this stuff comes through, and I wore him out. Like, he, he was almost puking at the end of it, and, like, couldn't breathe, and had it, and it was not to demoralize him, but to show him, like, you need to rely on your technique, because he wasn't doing any technique, he was, he was trying to stiff arm me, and, sure. you know, try to get away from me, and well, I was on him, like, white and rice, so, yeah. and then I, I rode knee on belly on him to where he couldn't breathe, and then once his, his breathing went away, and once all his muscles started taking in all that oxygen, he went down. and so, um, I think that kind of got a buy-in from them, and then that was before we were teaching jiu-jitsu at our, at our department, so I think that kind of helped influence and move a little, like, Wow, this 190 semi-athletic kid, <laughs> you know, is able is able to put it on these other bigger, highly athletic, you know, in their athletic prime coming through. Yeah, and uh, you know, prove the effectiveness effectiveness of them. And then when he walks in back to his class, and they're like, you can see on their faces when they're walking back, and like their their shirts ripped out of their pants, and like their their equipment's all over the place, catching their breath, and all their classmates look, and they're like. Oh, who did who did that to to this guy? Yeah, you know? and then they see it's like 195, which I'm not a small guy, but I'm not I'm not that. Yeah. Um, oh, no, like Paul, Paul weighs 155 pounds. I put Paul up against any of those guys too, and he yeah. he's the best advertisement for good jitsu we have. Someone who's 155 pounds that can literally control anybody untrained on the department and anyone trained as well. Yeah, you, you know what. There's a there's a big tie-in to me between what you're doing and what the Old Rollers podcast is about too, and that was a that was one of the reasons that I wanted to bring you on. Partially just because you're my friend, I wanted to hang out with you. Like it's it's actually just kind of fun to learn yeah. your history and stuff. But but moreover, is as a police officer, just like as a jujitsu athlete, you don't get a choice in aging. You know, like the day you start, if you're if you're just out of college, you know, 21, 22 year old uh, Division One athlete, you're going to probably be in pretty good shape against just about anybody that you you find yourself facing on the street who isn't trained in, you know, like a fighting art. Sure. That said, even you will not be that forever. You know that uh, that those gifts have uh, you know a a time limit, mm-hmm. and it may be a long one, but we don't want to have people, you know, uh, being injured out or, or you know, even worse, uh, because they they they're not trained in how to you know have longevity and how to take care of themselves and how to be safe, you know. So the idea of I want to be a jujitsu practitioner for the rest of my life, and initially I wanted I thought that I wanted to be a jujitsu practitioner to my 65th birthday. Then I met Tom Corey, who started jiu-jitsu at 65, and is a vicious brown belt at 72. That changed my standards. It changed what I thought my athletic life would be. Uh, I had to stop saying that <laughs> because 65 is now well. That's that was a good start for Tom. Yeah, that, you know? That's awesome. So I don't know what the if, if you guys have a mandatory retirement age. I don't know if, if mm-hmm. you, you can just continue as long as you you know mm-hmm. want to. Uh, to still do it, but it seems to me that there is a, 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 a direct connective line between longevity in sport and longevity in a physical occupation such as being a police officer. Sure. Given that, and I know you're younger than the average, you know, uh, old roller person that I would interview, meaning like someone over 40, because I'm 40, so anybody older than me is <laughs> an old roller. Yeah. Yeah, but you're younger than me. But I feel old. Well, you know. I have more gray hair than you, I think. Uh, I don't have any hair, you prick. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. But the, the, the point being there is you may not have as many years, but athletically you have a lot more miles than I do. So what are some things from a longevity standpoint, both within the job and, you know, uh, within your jujitsu? 
that you do to, to keep yourself able to, to perform at that high level, like as much as your body sure. will give you? Well, I've had to change my style, um, and I would say not so much my technique. When I say my style, I mean my style training. I would have to change my style of training. I have slowed it down probably to the last like year and a half, I would say. I have <laughs> slowed But before that, like, I, I was a spazzy brown belt. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I can't imagine that. Yeah. I don't really. <laughs> well, I, I, I focused a lot on winning rounds rather than competing against other people rather than competing against myself. And so more about like the win within the five minutes as opposed to like trying to test and improve and, and yeah. really grow. Like yeah. working on positions, working sure. on working on techniques, you know. And of course, I'm not. I would slow it down for you know the, the lowly purple. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, the the yeah. lowly purple, but like the I, I would, doughy, uh, you know, post you know, like when going with the the you know the upper belts in the class and the higher level guys and the bigger guys. You know, I, I always you know. I, Try to give my all so yeah, that I was sure. in that round. Sure. And that led to a lot of injuries. And still leads to a lot of injuries. That's that's the biggest way I can say that you can probably mitigate that risk of injury is don't worry about winning your round. Don't worry about winning your round at all. Focus on something. And so, like, and I'm sure you've, I don't know how much you've seen from me, but like, I never would start 50 50 with anybody. Yeah. Because that's not a position I want, because that's not a position I'm going to win that round. Yeah. And then, you know, once, once I started to feel stagnant at Brown Belt, I'm like, I, I really need to involve pieces of my game. You know, I started going to you and like, hey, let's start 50-50 every time. Yeah. And really taking, starting there and kind of working that with other people as they're rolling. Not just that position, but that kind of mindset of, I'm going to start here and I'm going to work through this position and I'm not going to worry if I win this round, lose this round, tap 10 times, tap him 10 times. Right. Uh, I'm just going to work and, and work through there. And so once you can get out of that mindset and get out of your own ego, and that it's the MMA mindset was very much like that. And I'm sure you've rolled with MMA guys who are, you know, explode out of positions and try to try to move really hard. I think it, it's similar to what we were saying with with Keith Owen with police officers. If you're going to step into a cage with someone who's being paid to beat the shit out of you, you have to have a mental. Uh, trust in your ability to win even if it's ugly you know what I mean mm-hmm. and so I understand it from a from an MMA fighter standpoint I don't I don't think if you're going into that cage it's easy to have to know in the back of your mind that I've tapped 150 times this week you know because I was working on oh sure you know working on dealing with someone with good spider guard or something and I'm not good at that so I got I ate yeah. a lot of shit that's not a great thing sitting in the back of your mind to step in and have them lock that cage door behind you. Yeah. So I understand from an MMA fighter perspective why that must be. Uh, but also, what, just just like what you said, where as you were transitioning through brown belt and you felt yourself stagnating and maybe plateauing, you started to say, where are the spots where I'm, I'm not comfortable and how can I be in those spots and create a level of comfort? So initially, your performance goes like this, but over time, it comes back up and, and you can reach a new plateau because you've, you've dug through the shit down here that you, know, you were hiding yeah. from. It wasn't fun and it tastes like crap, but once you get over it, the best fertilizer is shit. You know, like I hate to say oh, that, yeah. but it is. Um, so I, with MMA fighters, I, I do get it, but I also think that there is benefit in knowing, like, I've dug through a whole lot of shit and I can handle it. You know, like, I, I've figured some stuff out about myself by taking those hard, hard looks at, like, where am I not good? Sure. Yeah. yeah. And that's the best way to improve. And my mindset during that time, I mean, you know, I was a four strike brown belt for two years. I, I didn't know the, the length of I, maybe, maybe 20 months. I, somewhere around two years. I don't, I don't remember exactly when I got my four strike. Good well. Yeah, it, yeah. I was, it was definitely over a year and a half. So I was a four strike brown belt for a year and a half. And I always, like, I would have this thought of, like, I, I win more rounds against black belts than I'm losing. Mm-hmm. And so I need to be a black belt. I should be a black belt. And then I had the realization of, well, maybe they're just working on it. Maybe 
maybe they're not trying to win this round. I'm trying to win the round, which is why I'm winning it. And then once I started moving away from that mindset of, of um, you know, I'm, I'm going to win these rounds, I'm, I'm going to start working through things and start trying to evolve my game, I think I had the black belt ability for a while. I don't think I had the black belt mindset. Hmm, I see what you're saying. Yeah. And so once I started developing that mindset and really trying to evolve my game and, and get better, I, I don't think my skill level has you know grown exponentially in, in a year's time. Sure. But I feel like my mindset and my training style and um, you know exploring different things that maybe I haven't done before, I think that is you know increasing my development and proving to myself that you know I'm worthy of a black belt. Rather than just going in there and saying, you know, I can beat, I can beat all these black belts on this <laughs> man, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, yeah, having the ego part of it. Yeah, and, and and once again, I understand, especially coming from you know the the, the MMA background, you know, you, you want to win those rounds. You know, mm-hmm. that's it makes sense to do that. But I also, I I definitely see the value in the. And, and this is a lesson from the podcast. You know, it's just been repeated over and over. If we if we look at things and divide it between training and testing, so training should be a complete effort at development. And in training, you can win, you can lose. It doesn't matter if you improve, then you won, right? Testing is different because testing you don't get better from testing. You're merely checking where you're at. So that's like a competition or an MMA fight or something like that. In that case, it's win at all costs. You know, it's 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 just win. Like take your A game. Don't go in there trying to work on you know this new spider guard trick that you you saw on YouTube. Sure. You know what I mean? So um, if you can see the the training mat as a lab, whose purpose is to just get better, then over time your testing will show the benefit of that. But for a time, there will be a drop. Because if you just went with A game and athleticism, you'll do well for a long time. But there is a limit to it. Whereas the, you know, really, like, to, to give an example, Emily Clock won the One Worlds. The next year, when she competed, she lost every single match. Every match, she lost every single one of them for a year. And the reason being is because she had polished and sharpened her A game to such a level that it took her to took her to gold. But people figured out that it's like, we got to stay away from that. And everything else was not up to par. And so people were really, you know, uh, putting it on her. And can you imagine what that would do from just from an ego standpoint oh, yeah. of like, I'm a world champion, and I'm getting beat in, like, this local Naga. You know, not to disrespect Naga, but, like, you know, I'm getting beat by somebody who is definitely not a world class. Um, those things are hard. The way that she came back to being a world champion was to just go back and work exclusively on all those weaknesses that she had ignored for all that time. Lose your A-game. Right, yeah. You, you are good at your A-game. Yeah. You can tweak it, you can add to it, but... Especially when you're rolling with lower belts, you need to abandon it altogether. As far as your development goes, you need to abandon it. You need to work on positions that you are not comfortable with, or positions that you were trying to really focus and develop that on par with your game. Mm-hmm. And so, I, I'm I'm a big believer in, in trying to really focus on a position and then working with everyone through that position. And the best work you're going to get are from the blue belts and the purple belts because they, they're not going to let you get to... It's not going to be a an easy tap. It's not, they have enough knowledge and enough know-how and enough positioning, um, a p- positional control to where they can find... If you're not doing something right, they can make you pay for it. Yeah, that's or, what you're Or if you're trying to take advantage of something... Um, they're not going to let you if your your technique's out. Uh-huh. You know, and, and that would be especially hard if if you're walking with the mindset of, you know, I'm I'm a brown belt out here catching black belts more than they're catching me, so I should be, you know, a black belt. To then shifting that and saying, okay, let's start a 50-50 with a purple belt, and I'm getting caught two or three times in a round, which I'm not getting caught two or three times in a week other than that, right. you know. 
uh, that's that's got to be a tough transition mentally, you know, because you got you got to shift how you accept that. I think that's the evolution of brown to black, honestly. You know, letting go of that ego, especially someone that wrestled coming up or came through a high high athletic background or mm-hmm. you know, MMA background, things that I think that's the difference between your mindset that evolution from brown to black. You might have the skills, you might have the techniques, you might be able to beat brown to black belts, but that doesn't make you a black belt. Black belt is living that black belt style, having that, that black belt type of training so that you can work and you really develop and have an overall, you know, uh, very skilled, well-rounded game. Yeah, that's that's a really, uh, I, I think that's a, that's a, a fascinating and just very well-said take on what is a black belt. You know, everybody probably has different opinions about it, but there's a whole lot of people like me uh, who want to become that at some point, and uh, we're all trying to absorb what is it going to mean. You know, what what do I have to become in order to to you know, reach that level? And part of it is technical, but it, it almost sounds like part of it is is attitude wise. Like there's a there's a way of thinking that's required that if you can't do that, you may have the physical skill and still not be that. No, oh, yeah. And I also feel you have to prove yourself as well. Like you said earlier, like that testing phase, I think it's so important for a promotion that you you compete. You compete against people your same age, your same weight, and your same rank. Level playing field. And just because you don't win doesn't mean you're not ready for that promotion. Maybe they're the person you lost to is ready as well, but if you, if you can go out there and show that you know, I, I, I'm just as skilled or more skilled than all the other blue belts, and then yeah, maybe you are ready for a purple belt. And same thing with being a brown belt. If you can go out there, and you can dominate a brown, a brown belt position, you can prove your skill there, and then in the training, you can prove your skill and your mindset. You know, and another element, and this this is actually uh, very close to heart, uh, when you guys went to the, the World uh, Police and Fire Games that, you know, you kind of got skunked on because of uh, the weather, uh, Paul, in his training run-up, um, had gone to do a local tournament, and he he wasn't going to that tournament necessarily to win. He was going to see, you know, where can I have some trouble and make some mistakes and still be okay. And there there was a competitor that he that he uh, he had a match against who had a really fantastic, aggressive submission-based close guard, and. Watching the video because I didn't get to go, I, I'm I'm thinking to myself like, why is Paul just letting himself stay in this car? Because I knew he could pass it, but he was he was just staying in that hot zone, and eventually he did get submitted, and he's like, yeah, I, I got caught. And he's like, but I didn't have to be there the whole time, and I know going into the games that I'm not going to be letting this happen. He's like, but I could tell this guy had a really good aggressive close guard, and. Uh, the fact that I was safe in it for as long as I was is a real good indicator for me that when we go, I'm going to have a pretty good uh, run. Yeah. Thanks for bringing up the sore spot. Yeah, well, that and that was that was tough because you guys, I was part of that. I knew that I was part of that training camp. Cause yeah. <laughs> so uh, it sucked that that the weather worked out the way it did, uh, and, but you guys did everything you could. and. Um, I think that you would have defended your title. Uh, I, I hope so. I, I haven't lost it yet. Yeah, I'm still, <laughs> He's still undefeated. Yeah. Two times. <laughs> Two times. Um, haven't lost it yet. But I don't know. The, what we're talking about is the World Police and Fire Games, which is like a, an Olympics type event for police and firefighters and law enforcement altogether. Federal agents come out to it, and it's really a, a great gathering of all these different athletes from all these different types of sports and. Um, wrestling's uh, one of the events that I've done there previously, and then um, grappling. So this is going to be the first year they're going to do gi and no gi. Oh, that's cool. And so this year's games was, it's every two years, this year's game, or I guess last year's now, was going to be in China, and we were on the flight. Blue Jitsu was going, all three of us, me, Paul, and Sam, were going to, flying over to um, compete, and a tsunami? Is that what they call it over there? No, it's typhoon. Typhoon? Yeah. No, I think it's tsunami. Typhoon's a giant wave. No, no, tsunami is a giant wave. Typhoon is like a hurricane. Uh, in I think it's in the southern hemisphere. A hurricane. I'm gonna have to fact check on that. Whatever it was. Um, 
Was it like a hurricane? So yes. we'll, we'll forget what it was. It was, it was. it was. It was a. It was, a, a, it was an Asian storm. An Asian storm hurricane. It was a big ass storm. Hit Shanghai as we are like literally getting on the plane to go to Shanghai, and so we got delayed in San Francisco. And once we got to Shanghai, uh, we got delayed a day. So we still we accounted for two days. So we still had a day. Once we got to Shanghai, they delayed our flight to Chengdu, which was on the other side of China, another two days. So we had we had flown to China to compete and had missed the competition. Yeah, and we're basically stuck in China. Um, but Paul and I we went to the games in 2018 in in downtown Los Angeles, which is right next to Staples Center. It was it was awesome. It was a, a cool collection of just cops that train. Yeah, um, and there were like 30 countries represented. It was the hardest jiu-jitsu tournament I've ever competed in, like as far as competition-wise. Um, the guy I beat in the semifinals was a, um, a former UFC fighter from LAPD, and then um, the guy I faced was in the finals was a black belt from Gracie in Oakland. He was a firefighter from uh, Gracie in Oakland, and then um, that UFC fighter he didn't even take third; he took fourth. So it, it was a very competitive competition. Two years before that, I did it in Fairfax and um, competed against a guy from St. Paul who's a black belt now, and we still stay in touch. And a great guy, and he runs a defensive tactics program up there. And so, like, they talk about a safe building, like a bunch of cops that know how to fight. <laughs> the only thing that's more safer than that was, you know, the wrestling event because, like, jujitsu, you get a bunch of cops that. You know, some of them have been lifelong jiu-jitsu guys, but probably most of them probably started in their adult years. Whereas the wrestling, yeah. everybody in that wrestling gym had started wrestling at a and young age. Four. And yeah, exactly. It's like Mongolia brought a team of all these like little Tasmanian devil wrestlers that like, you know look like just tear your heart out right in front of you and eat it, and like um, just all these lifelong like badasses. Yeah, that also Not became jokes. yeah <laughs> also became police officers at some point. And, like and. To sort of tie all that together, the competitive mentality is one that I think is required, you know, on the streets, you know, I hate to put it that way, but in your occupation, you go out there and, you know, people may want to check you, you know, so you've got to have a willingness to, you know, to deal with that. And so competing, while it's not a fight, it is a much higher level of intensity yeah. than is rolling. I also think the the lab training element is necessary too to build uh, all the weaknesses and all the holes and the non a game stuff because I would imagine in in a scuff you <laughs> you're going to use a game stuff you know oh yeah which for you is probably like blast doubles and then blast doubles and then <laughs> I'll throw a single leg in there right now I've never seen you throw a single leg single except my favorite takedown <laughs> I'll show you next time we roll I don't want to see it. I don't mean, uh, I'm not, you're not going to have a choice in the matter. Fair enough, I'll just butt scoot. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I, I do have control over the uh, the training environment. Yeah. I'm not getting double leg because I'm already on my boot day. Yeah. That, all that said, uh, on a personal level, I think the, the, the training environment and then the competitive environment make a more holistic self-defense um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Self-defense capable person. Sure. Okay. In the blue jitsu kind of, you know, snow globe, where it's just the seminars and it's the the curriculum and and you know trying to get people. How do you? What do you do to help a person? Uh, you know, who maybe is more like me. You know, because once again, this is an old rollers podcast. Uh, they got a few years on them. Maybe they don't have the highest athletic ceiling. And you know, what do you say to that person? It's like, okay, you're you're a police officer, and what can we do to get you as safe as you can be for as long as possible? Sure, I, I think it's the same concept you would start with with, a, with a, any white belt, right? Um, you start them slow. You just like how you know we do at our gym. They don't roll for three, four weeks until they can prove that they're picking up on the basic techniques and, you know, can kind of watch everyone else and watch how controlled we can roll if we roll controlled. 
Um, but what was that what you were saying? Yeah. <laughs> I owe you one. Uh, but yeah, a, a big part of it is the mental part of it, which you had talked about, you know, being ready on the streets. Well, if officers out there have something to prove, they will quickly not have something to prove if they train. And so, yeah, and, and I don't want to sound like I'm coming at that from a place of experience. I'm only no, guessing no, as to yeah. what that experience is because I don't know it. Sure, and, and there's officers out there that, you know, you buck up to them, they're going to buck up to you. Like My philosophy on use of force is I'm not going to use this force unless I have to. Whereas a lot of people, and I'm a patient person, I'm a, I've been there, I've done that, I don't need to I don't need to show this guy that I can throw him on the ground. Sure. Um, a lot of people don't have my patience. Or patience of somebody who's trained jiu-jitsu and been through, you know, the, the battles on the mat and things of that nature. And, and so when someone bucks up to them, they buck up. Instead of de-escalating it, they escalate it or they meet that, they meet that force. Yeah. Um, when, I'm not saying they don't have to or, or whatnot, but maybe quicker to... I don't want to say pull the trigger, but yeah, no, but every to engage rather than to you know wait it out. Yeah, and a every I, scenario is different. Sure. And my perception of what a threat would be, because I don't deal with people you know trying to be aggressive to me very often, is probably going to be a lot higher than yours, just because you have more experience with people in that environment. Sure, and it's always good to know in the back of your mind, like whether it's true or not. I can take that guy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that's, that's always that's always something that's comforting for me and I think a, a lot of that keeps me calm. if I didn't have any kind of combative training whatsoever didn't have any kind of background I, I'd probably be as bad as just like everybody else sure um, but the fact you know in the back of my head and I'm, I'm sure Sam and Paul and anyone else that trains with us can attest to it like if you know in the back of your head like mm -hmm, I can take this guy and even if it's not true which I'm sure there's some untrained guys in Lexington that, you know, would probably give me a run for my money, but I still have that mindset of, I don't need to escalate this. If, if he chooses to go down that route, I can handle it, and I'm not worried about it. Um, and that keeps my heart rate down. That keeps everything kind of calm and cool, so I don't have this nervous energy that comes out through a use of force encounter. That makes sense. And so, uh, it's all. I talk about the benefits of jiu-jitsu, I would say 50% of it for us is, is mental. Mm -hmm. um, if, if what you gain from jiu-jitsu helps you physically in controlling someone and having the techniques and all that stuff, that's great, but the mental side of it to where you can stay calm and breathe and, and work through a situation, slowing everything down, having the confidence that I don't need to directly engage this guy or I don't need to escalate force because I know I can do it like that mental side of it plays such a huge factor and then you know all the other benefits that we always talk about as well yeah you know just for the regular citizens for you know regular society uh, I, I, I really like that as a pitch you know because what, what we're basically saying is that if you're a police officer and you're not involved with you know a, a, a training group like uh, Blue Jitsu find one you know it, it's uh, the environment even if it's a bunch of non-police officers because you know I obviously I train with a lot of police officers you being one I'm not one uh, but it you're safe in that environment because I, I look around and you know nobody's out to prove anything to you guys you know and I would say more than 95% of mats would be the same situation. oh yeah the the law enforcement jiu-jitsu community is huge more than I do um, there's several gyms that are doing this it's called an adopt a cop program um that just is a recent thing with everything that's happened lately to where they're sponsoring officers to train for free until they get their blue belt and so that's becoming very popular and a lot of gyms are adopting that saying yeah just come just come train like no excuse just come out here we'll give you a, a safe fun training environment just come out here and train and i think that's a that's an amazing thing for they probably wouldn't be getting money from a membership because they probably wouldn't be enticing someone to come train anyway. Yeah. Uh, unless they really wanted to, and then at that point they'd be willing to pay. Yeah. Um, but even then, a, a blue belt is a serious difference. Like between white belt and blue belt, you could s the the standard has become that that person has been become combatively effective. Yes. And so that is, 
just for the community, forget the business you know, that, that is inviting this person in for free. That helps the community. If you have combatively effective police officers and, and a large groundswell of them, I think, once again, in this kind of fractious, you know, scenario that we're in politically, that's good for all of us. Oh, yeah. That's not just good for the officers. I get asked, and you you haven't asked me yet. I'm sure the question's coming. Because I don't care. <laughs> Most people don't care what I have to say. I'm used to it. But um, I get asked often, is uh, what level belt should an officer be? How, how much skill should an officer obtain to where they're at the minimum they should be? And a lot of people say blue belt. Um, I, I don't even think it's that far. I think it's a two-stripe white belt. Hmm. Um, and the reason I say that, and I don't know if that's a popular opinion or an unpopular opinion. No one's opposed it, but most people say blue belt. Some people even say purple, which I think they're, they're not realistic goals for, you know, for someone going through the academy and just starting off a new career and having limited time to train. Yeah. And so the two-stripe white belt, I think of it like that because society is, unless you go up against someone trained, which is not very often do we face people that are trained, Society is the is the no stripe white belt. They're the they're the person who walked in the door for the first day. Yeah. So if you can get to a two stripe white belt, you are a level above society. Not everybody. I mean, obviously, there there's a good majority of people that have that you know athletic ability, sure. or, or maybe have some training or some type of yeah. you know fighting ability. But if you can bring yourself to a level, if every officer was at the level of a two stripe white belt. And so just just a step above what the rest of society is, um, that would make the police department so much more effective in use of force. That would make arrests so much more cleaner. Because we have two sharp white belts that I review a lot of BWCs for use of force because I'm, I'm a uh, defensive tactics instructor. And when I say BWC, I mean body worn camera footage. Okay. So I, yeah. I review a lot of that, and we've had several. Um, come through here recently from some white belts that engage a guy, get him in a Kimura, immediately put his hand behind his back. He's still fighting. It might take 15, 20, 30 seconds, but they get him under control under a minute. Yeah. Whereas if that was not a two stripe white belt, or the kid I'm thinking of specifically, I don't even know if he has two stripes, but has enough training to where he can go and he can recognize where he has opportunity for to isolate an arm with Kimura. And control a person. If it's not him, that fight goes different. Officer is going to win it. Uh, officer, there's multiple officers and one person. They're going to come out on top, but it's not going to look as clean. It's not going to look as professional. It's probably going to escalate in, in the type of force used. Yeah. And so. Um, and that starts to look, you know, to to go into the more the political realm as well. It's like even though that officer does, you know, win win the exchange. Because it looks, they're just the pure optics of it are different. That that can potentially be problematic. Whereas, a well, really if we're labeling video number one and video number two, video number one, two strike white belt, video number two, untrained officer. Uh, no one sees video number one because it's out of them. <laughs> the only person who watched it was me, and I got super, super excited. I was like, "Yeah, that's it. like, like, like I, I'm like, yeah." I, I sent him a text. I was like, "Man, that was awesome!" Like, I got so pumped because. Um, he's using the techniques that we're teaching and he's well versed and it's, it, this kid's not some kind of athletically gifted like you or I he's you know <laughs> he's, he's just a you know a, a skinny normal normal kid that uh, yeah. you know has a little bit of jiu-jitsu training so he goes in and he controls this person quickly and no one sees that no one sees that because it, it's not newsworthy there's, there's but that's the best but, scenario yeah. no one cares because there was nothing to care about yes. it was a simple well, you know, well put together scenario mm -hmm. where the person did what they were supposed to do, and you know the the suspect probably didn't go home happy. But we're not. Yeah, nothing to complain about. Yeah. He get hurt. He like yeah. He resisted arrest and got arrested within a minute. Yeah. I don't. I don't know what you have to say. What to complain about? All right. Well, I think that's a a really great place for us to uh, uh, to wrap up, uh, just because I think we've talked about. Uh, all of your experiences that, that have led up to your vision for Blue Jitsu and how helping officers uh, maintain you know themselves in a, in, a, in a trained way so that they're the most safe really is an old rollers task too. You know, it's not just for 
you know, your young athletic 22 year old, like if you're a 50 year old officer who's a two stripe white belt, we know that you can be combatively effective. And that's a very valuable thing to have. Um, if somebody wants to find out more about you uh, personally or Blue Jitsu, uh, let's say you've got some police officer friends that you know and uh, you want to get them some help uh, with uh, some technical training. Uh, obviously my friend Chris and, and uh, uh, Paul can, and uh, Sam can help you out there. How do they uh, get a hold of you and learn more about you? So our organization is big on social media. Um, we do weekly what we call Technique Tuesdays and so we'll show techniques that applicable on the mats, also applicable on the streets, applicable, applicable for our profession. Um, our social media handle is at Blue Jitsu Lexington um, for Instagram and then Facebook dot com slash blue jitsu lexington and then we have a website where we have all our information hasn't been updated since the covid since we're not putting out any events right now but um that's blue jitsu lexington dot com uh well once again thanks chris for coming to join me i think you've had um i know you're a little bit younger than i am which makes you a non-old ruler uh, but when we talk about the mileage and stuff i think you have you know some really uh, great insights about how to uh, keep yourself on the mat, which for you is also keeping yourself on the job. Yes. So I think uh, you've got a lot to offer to even us regular folk uh, who are not, you know, super athletes and uh, police officers. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, trying to, to stay on the mat as long as possible and be as good there as we can. Sure. So uh, thanks for your time and your insight. I really can't uh, thank you enough. It's been awesome. Thanks for having me.